Hello everyone, welcome today, this Saturday, the 27th of September for Classroom 2.0 Live. Our topic today is our featured teacher for the month, who is Kathy Cassidy. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, as well as Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for doing closed captioning for us. Again, our special guest is Kathy Cassidy. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Tony, who will now introduce Kathy. Hi, uh, welcome to my friend Kathy Cassidy. Uh, we met at Discovery Education Summer Institute uh, a couple of years ago, um, and as part of the Canadian contingent, we got together uh, as a small group. I've been fascinated with Cassidy, uh, Miss Cassidy's work. Um, I was just visiting her classroom blog this morning. And uh, there are some wonderful ways that these children have shared what they show what they know, you know, that sort of thing. So it is really great to have you here today. She's been um, blogging. She's had a, a classroom blog and blogs for each of her students since 2005. Um, her students have their own blog and they've developed now into online portfolios so they can showcase all their learning. Uh, their writing, reading, math, all their subjects they can showcase using drawings or screencasts, podcasts, videos. She, um, when she started out with a one iPad classroom or maybe she had one or two, but she now has a one-to-one -one iPad classroom. Um, she has so much to share with us today. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I would like to introduce to you um, Mrs. Cassidy, Kathy Cassidy today. Thank you, Tony. It's <clears throat> sorry. It's such a pleasure to be back at Classroom Two Point I so admire what the people who who run it. Peggy has been there a long time, I know, and um, that they keep doing this week after week and allowing people to learn together. It, it's such a gift to the educational community. So I really appreciate that they do that. I agree. I agree. It's just been wonderful for my learning as well. Now we have a newbie question. It says, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So to me, Web 2.0 implies that there was a 1.0 and, and I think that Web 1.0 was when the Internet first began and people started to find out that they could find information online. That was very exciting. People could go and look up things and read things. But there was none of the interactivity that there is now. It was just people would post stuff if they had the technolo technological knowledge to post. People would do that, and we could read and see what they had. Now, with the advent of blogs and uh, wikis and other things that allow people to begin to contribute without having to have all that technical knowledge to create a web page, that for me was Web 2.0. It was opening up the web so that it was not just one-way communication but two-way, that people could contribute to each other's um, learning and to each other's knowledge. That to me is Web 2.0. And I began blogging with my students 10 years ago um, and I began because, first of all, I wanted to be able to show what my students were doing and I wanted a way for my students to use the technology that we had in our classroom in meaningful ways. And so we began using blogs and that was our first Web 2.0 tool that each of my kids had their own blog and then we started getting comments. Then from that it just led to other things like Skype and then we began using wikis, eventually Twitter came around and um, I was hesitant at first to use that with my students, but then I, I decided that I could find a way to make that an educationally sound um, thing to do, and so I began using Twitter as my classroom. We have used a lot of different technologies um, of Web 2.0, and I really, really value how important it is in my classroom. I would like to start today by asking you to type into the chat why you think connecting your classroom is important. So 
So if you could, while I'm talking, if you could just type in and say, why, why do you think it's important that we connect our classrooms? I am going to tell you in a few minutes why I think that it's important, but I would like to know what you think about why it's important. From I, I sort of was playing with words here when I, I did this title, Connected from the Start, because I teach very young children. Um, that doesn't have to be young children, though. It could be from the start of your school year that you're thinking, why do you think that, that it's important? Yes, definitely an audience, and the world is bigger. Yes. Oh wow, great answers. Thank you. Okay, I want I think all of you have great things to say about this. I've thought about it this a lot about why I do it because I'm often asked that. And I think one of the reasons is that I think digital is here to stay. And I think that that tools that connect people with other people are here to stay. That's what people want to do. They want to connect. And so because I think that the, connect, the world of connecting in digital is going to be so much a part of my students' lives as they grow and as an adult. It, it would not surprise me at all if, if most of my students spent part of their day working with people in another part of the world as an adult. I think it's important to start to teach them how to use these, these tools now. Also, I think that students in particular see the internet as a place to play. My students all have their favorite websites and apps that they like to go to to play. And I want to show them that it's important to use the, those, the internet and to use the connections that are there to be able to learn. Because I think that that's what's really important, that we learn to use the internet to help us learn. And what's appropriate to do, what's appropriate at the age that my kids are, six and seven year olds, and what's appropriate as they get older when they're 12, what's appropriate when you're 18, what's appropriate when you're an adult. And that's a gradual um, release of responsibility for the person who is shepherding them or who is guiding them. But um, I think that it's important that they learn how to be safe and how to, how to do that. I, I'm going to talk some more about what my rules are for keeping safe in a minute. I'm going to talk today about three tools primarily, um, just because of the, the time constraints that we have. And the first one I want to talk about is Skype. And the reason I, I like Skype in my classroom is because you don't have to be able to write to do this. And my kids come to me in grade one as pre-readers pre and writers. And so even from the beginning of the year, we can use Skype as, as a tool. We have used it in the past to connect with experts. It, it used to be that when I wanted an expert in my classroom, I would have to contact somebody in the community and they would come in and, and talk to my, my students. And I still do that. I still, the policemen still can come in, but fewer and fewer people can come in. I can't get people from public health, for example, to come in anymore. I can't get uh, others to come in because people's lives are busier and busier. They have less time to be able to come into schools and share their knowledge with the students. But because we have access to the internet, we suddenly have access to all of the, all of the things that, that are available in the world. So with my students, we have connected with experts when we had questions about rocks. We connected with a geologist. When we had questions about what it was like to live in a smaller community, we collect, connected with a, um, another small community that's near Moose Jaw where we live and my, my students were enthralled to learn that there were communities where there was no McDonald's or Burger King and, and what was that like and, and what was it like to not have a superstore supermarket and they were enthralled by that idea that, that there were places where they didn't have the things that we have and the same would be true if we Skyped with someone who was from a larger community. Um, we have frequently Skyped with a nurse because part of um, my curriculum in health is learning about our bodies and, um, and about illness and disease. And so fortunately, I have a sister who is a nurse, and she can answer six and seven-year-old questions 
Um, and, and so that's what my kids do. They, they often, as in this picture, write down their questions on a little card and then just ask their questions of the expert. This was what my grade twos one year were, were doing this. Um, so we ask all sorts of questions. This was just happened this week and some of my kids had questions and I found someone who was willing to answer them and, um, and they did. They asked their questions and we still have lots of questions to answer but the ones that could be answered by this particular expert were answered by her and, and later on we'll, we'll try to connect with people who can answer the other questions. Basically, when you are the age that my students are, then anyone is an expert to you. And so it's not hard to find someone that knows more about their body or more about reading or anything than a six or seven year old. Um, if you teach older students, then obviously you're going to have to work a little bit harder to find an expert, but they are out there and they're available. And at the end, I'm going to talk to you about some ways you can find these experts. I have found that really um, anyone who's willing to listen to my kids is an expert. Um, Pre-service teachers are particularly good for listening to other to the to the children read, and so often through the year, I'll just make a list of who wants to read with with um, somebody, and the kids will read to that person. And sometimes at the very beginning, they're just holding up the book like this and and letting the other person see. So really anyone can do this. I've often thought that grandparents might be a, a good source of, of someone who could do this with my students because uh, many of them are retired and at home and they have the time maybe to listen to, um, to my students read. Last year we started doing something called Mystery Number Skype and, and this wasn't my idea originally. The person who, who thought of this idea was I think Katie Tripp and she was um, thinking about with older kids but I started thinking about the possibilities with younger kids and it, it sort of blossomed from there. We did this often through the course of the year. Um, at the beginning we were just doing the, working on the numbers up to 20 and so my students would write those numbers on little whiteboards and we would pick a number and another class would pick a number and then we would ask questions that could be answered with a yes or no that would try to narrow down what the what the number was that the other class was thinking of and we would take turns answering questions. So for example, um, would it be better to ask is it 9 or would it be better to ask is it less than 10? And after doing it a, a few times and letting the kids ask whatever question they wanted to, we talked about what were juicy or fat questions and what questions were, were more limiting so that the students had a better idea of that. And, and, um, and it was a great way for them to get a, a number sense. And towards the end of the year, we started doing it um, with numbers up to 100. In that case, we didn't write it on our little boards. I just had one in front and the kids would ask the questions and we would cross them off of, of the 1 to 100 chart at the front. We have used it to talk about measurement and geometry as well. We have, um, so this is when we were doing volume and the other class um, was Karen Lehrman's class in British Columbia. They were also doing um, volume at the same time as us. So um, one of us would lift up two containers and then they'd say, which one do you think has more? And all the kids in both classes would have to vote about which they thought was more. They'd put their hands on their head if they thought the one on the right was more or their hands in their lap if they thought the other one was, was, uh, was larger or put their hands together in uh, their chest if they thought that that both were the same and or they weren't sure. And then all the students were participating and one would fill up one of the containers and dump it into the others and we would see which one it was. Or when we were doing geometry, it was a guess my shape kind of thing and I have a shape in my hand and, and you could talk the clues, you could give one clue like it's a 3D shape or or you could give the clue that it has three sides or it has one side and, and the students in the other class would try to guess what shape we were doing. So um, really I got thinking about this that, that really anything can be used in a Skype call. You just, it depends on the imagination of the teacher and, and the willingness of the people who you're Skyping with to, to do the same thing. Last year, this was our map that we had in our classroom. We, we started putting um, little pins to show where the people were that we had learned with over the course of, of the year. 
So, so that's Skype. And Skype, as I said, is a really good entry tool. You only need to have one computer to use it. It's great if, uh, when you have pre-readers and writers. Um, another tool that I want to talk about are, are, is blogging. Blogging was what I first started with when I started my Web 2.0 uh, journey. And blogging is the one thing in my classroom that I would have trouble giving up. If you had to say to me, what one thing would you give, would you want to have if you couldn't have all these tools, what's one tool you would keep? I would keep blogging. And one of the main reasons is what um, somebody I know talked about when we were talking about why would you want to connect your classroom, and that's because it gives the students an audience. They know we have an audience because of comments, but I've also got this cluster map on our blog, and they know that people from all over the world have been to our blog. Now, honestly, I know that some of those people click on there for two seconds and they're gone, and that's fine, but there was somebody there, and my students don't know that everybody came for two seconds. They assume that everybody's reading every post that they make, and so that's fine. That's great. Let them think how, that they're really great, but this gives them the idea that there's lots of people watching them and, and being part of their learning. And, and it gives them a sense that when they post, there are actually people that are going to see what they post and then we can talk about digital citizenship and what's appropriate. This is what my blog looks like. Actually, this is last year. I don't have a, a, this um, year's isn't quite up there yet. But um, this is what the class looked like last year. And then the important part, I think, about this blog is not mine, which is on the left-hand side. If you scroll down, you would see all the entries that I had put. I think the important thing is the left-hand side. And there you can see all the links to all of my students' blogs, where they share their learning. Um, here is a screenshot of what one of my students' blogs looked like last year. Um, Eliza. So Eliza says that she likes playing with her brothers and sisters and at school she likes elephant and piggy. She thought it was important as a tagline to say that she likes broccoli. I let the students choose those things for themselves and then you can see that was around the time we were doing capacity and so she had a picture of capacity and a little probably an explanation below it of what was going on. My students blogs started out to be just a place for them to record their writing. And, and it was just a writing portfolio then. Um, how is their writing getting better through the year? That, that's such a dramatic change in grade one, but hopefully there's a change in every year in how well the students can write. So as I said, it started for me as a writing portfolio, but it has become so much more. When I started, it was necessary to, if I wanted to put pictures on my students' blogs, I had to post them to Flickr and then for each individual picture I had to grab the HTML code, I had to log in as that student and put those pictures on. So I did it, but I only did it about once a month because it took a lot of time to do that. And, and so it wasn't as ideal as I would, would like it to be. The tools are becoming better and better for doing that and for the students to be able to do it themselves. As um, they mentioned at the beginning, I'm now one-to-one -one with iPads. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now it's so easy with the apps that EduBlogs has and that KidBlog has. It's so easy to put the, put the pictures in, the videos in. I always say a six-year-old can do it. And if a six-year-old can do it, then any students that you have, whatever age they are, can do it as well. So on our blogs, we, we post our writing still, as we were doing long ago, and we get comments on, on what we are, are doing. And we post um, just about things that are happening in our classroom, and then we post as well about um, um, things that we're learning. So this particular one was just um, Atticus, I think it was Atticus, was talking about that he plays trouble with his family, he did an illustration, and I happened to respond to that one, and then Atticus responded back to me. We often have grandparents respond because they live in a different 
community and they know that all the all the things that we we uh, all the comments we get are read aloud together and they're celebrated and so they want to be part of that learning and and be close to their grandchildren aunts and uncles older brothers and sisters another source of comments I have is kids who have been in my class in the past once they get to about grade three, they come back and, and start commenting on the blogs of the students who are in grade one there because by that time they feel like they're the big kids and so they want to give back. They remember that somebody else did that when they were my students' age. On our blogs, we post pictures. So we might take pictures of an art piece we've done or some printing that we've done or, or anything that we've made that was not a digital thing. We might post that. We do screencasts that we might take a picture and then explain what we're doing. Um, we make podcasts of our reading fluency and post that so that we can a couple times to the year do that so that we can see the improvement in our reading throughout the year. Um, but pictures and, and writing are the, the most common thing that we put onto our blogs. Um, we post in all subject areas. Um, if you look on the sides of my students' blogs um, now, you'll see that there are categories. And I have started having them categorize their work so that if I'm looking or if somebody else is looking at their blog to see what have they posted in math, what have they been learning in math, then you can just click on math and you see all their posts that have been about math so far that year. And then I can go back and I use that as part of my assessment. Um, I should just mention that I think it's important that you realize that nothing, the things that I, my students post are not perfect. I consider this to be a form of formative assessment. And the only exception to that would be if I said to them, we're going to make an artifact now about our learning and that artifact is going to be about um, everything you've learned, for example, about the First Nations people. And I want you to um, think of a way that you can share your learning and put it into a digital form and then share it on your blog. And what, here are some things that I think that you should put in. What are some things that you think you should put in? What will it look like if you have a really great um, post? What will it look like if, if you don't have such a great post? So if I've talked to them about it being summative, then it becomes uh, a summative kind of assessment. And so I also put self-assessment things on their blog. I like them to think about their writing, for example, and, and talk about what things they think they're doing a good job of, what things are they going to get better at. So those, you'll see those kind of posts also on our blogs. Reading blogs, especially on the years I have grade twos, becomes um, an option during our read to self time. Um, so he, this is a student who is reading uh, blog posts um, as as a part of her reading that she wants to find out what's happening in the other classrooms that we follow. And this is just a picture of what it looks like when we're reading the comments of other um, of other classes that we read them together. One of the students points to the words and together it's our shared reading. Sorry, <coughs> excuse me. It's our shared reading time. And so we're reading this, and I think it's much more authentic than all of the posters that I have written out. I have lots of poems, and I have uh, lots of songs that are written out. And we used to use those at the beginning when we were still establishing wordness and as we're doing our shared reading time. I still do those. I still pull them out sometimes. But reading comments from other people is much more authentic. It's someone who they know has probably written it. And if it's a stranger, then it's been written right to them. It's not some generic um, thing. It's been written right to them or to their classmates or to our class. And my students absolutely delight to find mistakes in the people's um, comments, especially when it's not someone, one of their classmates, but it's somebody like a teacher from somewhere else or an older brother or sister or a parent. They love to say, they forgot to put a period at the end or they forgot a capital I which is a very common thing now for, um, for texting. And so the parents tend to do it. And they're so proud of themselves for knowing that that is wrong. And so we talk about that. We celebrate it, that they knew that. But we post it anyway, mistakes and all, just like their, their things that they post.
And I said I wanted to talk about how I treat safety in my classroom. And, and people always want to know what my rules are. And my rules are not the same as other people's, but here's what, what happens in my class. First of all, my division is fairly proactive about this. There is a form that goes home or that the parents actually sign when they register their children um, for our school. And it says, you know, that we may post student work online and we'll endeavor to protect their privacy and is this okay to do? And, and the parents generally sign that and say, yes, that's fine. If I have a parent, and I haven't for several years had a parent who said, no, they didn't want that, then I would talk to those parents personally and say, could you look at the blog at what was posted last year and would you then talk to me about it? And I have never, after the parents saw what was actually happening and that I followed the rules that I have, and I'll talk to you about those in a minute, I've never had a parent in those 10 years that after they looked at what was happening that didn't want their child to be involved. They all wanted their children to be involved. So here are the rules that I have and how I protect the students. You will see on my blog, you will see pictures of the students doing various things. You'll see all the students, but you will never know who those students are. I never mention by name those students. For the students' blogs, I do have their first name as part of their, uh, of their blog's name, but you will never see a picture of that child on their, um, on their blog. You might see their feet as they're stomping a pattern. You might see their hands as they're pointing to something and explaining an artifact that they've done in a video. But you will never see their face. So I never match names and faces on the blog and on, on either blog. If I ever did have a parent that, would, that wanted to ha not have their child's name there, then we would just use a pseudonym for that child. But as I mentioned, that hasn't ever happened. Or if I had a parent who didn't ever want their child's picture to be on my blog, I just wouldn't include pictures of that child, but that hasn't happened in those 10 years that I've been doing this. I'm very strict about this. In fact, if parents post a comment and if parents put their last name in their comment, then we read the comment and we celebrate it, but I don't post it. And we just delete the comment together as a, as a class and then I email the parents or, or phone them and just say, thanks for the comment. We couldn't, we enjoyed it, but we couldn't post it because of this. And the parents love that because then they know, oh, you really are being careful about what things you do. And I do this because my kids are so young. If I was teaching older kids, then it would be a different conversation. But I think it is a conversation that needs to be had with um, the parents and with the students. And we talk about safety all the time. I, I explain to my students why we have these rules and how I'm going to keep them safe. And, and what are things that, um, that we're going to do. We also have a class Twitter account. Now, I was not the first to jump on Twitter um, with my students because I wanted to make sure that there was a really good purpose for it. I'm very careful with my class about who we follow. We only follow, I think we're following nine uh, accounts presently, and a couple of those are um, accounts that just tweet pictures of animals because animals is part of our curriculum in grade one and two. Um, and we follow classrooms. We don't just randomly follow all the people that follow us because I want my students to be focused on appropriate things when we're reading our class Twitter account. And just like when we're reading comments, it's a group reading thing at first. And then as the students become better readers, I, Twitter is on their iPads and so they can read it independently or as you can see, they just like to see what other people are saying. So it, it doesn't really get so independent all the time because they're very keen to say what their, um, what their, um, they want to see what their peers are writing and they want to see the tweets from other classes. And, and so as the year goes on, I, I allow that as, even as part of um, our read to self time as well. We've learned so many things from Twitter. Um, I want to share with you one example from last spring. This is a, an example, Ms. this is again Karen Lairdman's class, that was one of the classes that we followed. And one day they tweeted this, hi, my name is Carmen, the salmon eggs are bigger. And my kids said, what's salmon? <laughs> and I had a pretty good idea what salmon was, but I decided not to share that with the students. I said, well, why don't we ask them? 
So Cohen was very keen, and, and so he, he wanted to post. He said, what's salmon? How huge are they? And because I wasn't sure if Karen would, would get the connection, I tweeted, I, I put in brackets salmon because to make sure that Karen would know. And this is how I do it on their blogs as well. Um, if I think that something might not be readable, which it, it generally isn't in their postings at the beginning of the year, I just put in brackets an editor's note to say, what they wanted it to say so that people can comment intelligently on what they have had to say even if it's not yet readable to the general public. If you're a primary teacher, I'm sure it's readable to you a lot earlier than other people. So this is our tweet back to them and this was their reply and Carmen again, Cameron says, salmon is a kind of fish. Here's a picture. And my kids, the light bulbs went on. Oh, they said, we get that. We get that at the store. I get it in a can. And I saw those fish before. And we had lots of chats about that. So serendipitous learning that happened because we were, were following that class on Twitter. And we got to watch and see what was happening with those eggs that were in, in their classroom. Um, we've used hashtags sometimes when we are tweeting. Sometimes we just use the hashtags so that I can aggregate the tweets together to share them. Like when we were doing riddles, um, this was, yeah, I think this was last year. And these are typical <laughs> six and seven year old tweets. And, and um, so, um, I mean riddles, they're typical riddles, uh, but they're learning what a riddle is and that that's the whole purpose. Um, sometimes we use hashtags to help us aggregate tweets with other classes. So last year, I think it was last year, perhaps, no, it was the year before last year, we decided that on the 100th day of school, we wanted to try to get 100 tweets using a, a hashtag. And so we thought we'd use the hashtag 100 stories of 100. And I realized that <clears throat> my 20 odd students could not tweet 100 times in the day if they were only tweeting about things that we did in our classroom because we wouldn't have time to do things and tweet. So I put it on Twitter and said, anybody else is celebrating 100th day, are you interested in doing this? And several classes were, and so they helped out. They tweeted the things that were happening in their classroom, and we were actually able to get 100 stories of 100, and because they had that hashtag in them, I was able to use a tool called uh, Storify, and we aggregated them together and, uh, in a story, and then we could share all those 100 tweets, and the kids could read them together. Um, just this week, we were using Twitter. Um, we were, are finishing up our patterning unit, and so, so oh, the kids were tweeting um, pat pictures of patterns that they had made, and classes are replying and telling us what we, they think our pattern is, maybe with colors, or they're translating it into um, letters, and, and that's part of what we're doing too. And so we're, we're learning in that way. This is, was a tweet from this week, and Ms. Beta's class replied to us and said, that looks like an AAB pattern and how they were translating and we were able to answer them and say, hey, we translate patterns too. And so just, just as in the same way as, as we did that with, um, with Skype, there's really infinite ways to use Twitter as well. Again, it sort of depends on the imagination of the people who are using it. That's what I always like to say. So, um, we've also live tweeted one time we were watching a live presentation from Discovery Education and another class was watching as well. And so while it, this is towards the end of the school year and I had ones and twos that year, and so they were a bit stronger writers. And so we, as we learned things, we would tweet them with a hashtag and the other class was also doing it at the same time. And then they were very keen to read back through and see what did they learn and was it the same? <clears throat> Was it the same as what we were learning? And so, um, so lots of good learning happened that way. So I know that this, this uh, group is fairly split about from the newbie question. So about half of you are blogging with your class, about half of you are using Twitter and, and using connecting with projects. So for those of you who haven't done this before, um, I often ask how can you get started to do this with your class? And so one of the ways that I always suggest is to register for, um, for Skype. Skype is education.skype.com is 
a place that you can register and um, you can for free. It's a completely free tool. And then once you are a member there, you can search through all the people who have been there. And you can search, some people might have projects that you would be interested in, in joining. Or if you just, for example, if you teach uh, second grade, you might want to search by second grade and just see what the projects are that people have created there or what teachers there are that are second grade. Um, you're, but you know for sure that you're going to find other teachers who have the ability to Skype in their classroom and perhaps they're interested in sharing with you. You could email them. You could set up your own project and something that you wanted to do uh, uh, with other classes and maybe somebody will, will join in for your project. Another way, a cool way to use Skype is to use uh, this authors who Skype their classes. Um, this Katie Mesner started this. And um, Peggy will put the link in for you, or it's also going to be in the live binder, I believe. And this is um, a place you can find. There, there's, if you want picture books, there's picture book authors who are willing to Skype for free. There's um, authors who are willing to Skype with a um, little bit older classes. So lots of choices for authors there. And that's a very cool place to start, too. 15 to 20 minutes is not a long time, um, but um, it, if you organize your questions ahead of time, then you can probably get quite a few questions in, depending on what kind of questions you ask. Projects by Jen is a great place to start if you teach pre-K to sixth. Um, she has projects going on all the time. For example, in September, the project was um, the Oreo project, how high can you stack Oreos? And if you register for her project, then she gives you access to the other people registered and you might want to Skype with the other classes to see how high could you stack Oreos before they fell over. And um, you can also uh, you know, share via email or whatever you want to do, just a way to connect with other classes. The project in October, I haven't checked, but it's usually counting the seeds in a pumpkin and at Christmas, she has a Christmas card exchange and we've also done um, how many, uh, Marshmallow shapes are there in a box of um, Lucky Charms at St. Patrick's Day and then you can compare with all the other people. Did you have more rainbow shapes or did they have more rainbow shapes? And, and so she has projects going on all through the year. So check that out if you teach pre-K to 6. ePals is also another one I, I recommend. Again, registration is free. And this is projects of all kinds. This is projects involving um, uh, Skype, it's in, involving blogging, email projects, in, you know, there's just all sorts of things. Um, I, I once suggested this to a group I was working on and, and this guy talked to me during the work time and, and he said he wanted, wanted to do some kind of a photography project. I can't remember what it was, but it seems fairly obscure to me and he was doing working with grade 11s and so I said, well, let's have a look and, and see if there's anybody and if not, you can create your own project. And, he, he put a topic in the search and the first one that came up was a teacher in Europe who was interested in exactly the same thing. And so if somebody can find a project that's as obscure as that in ePals, then I'm sure you can find something that you're interested in doing with somebody um, in ePals. So it's a good place to start. If you're blogging with your students, quad blogging is a great just place to start. If you're um, uh, doing it with um, younger students, then there's the primary blogging community. Um, I know that yesterday was the last day to sign up for the primary blogging community that Kristen Wydeen runs, but she'll have another one after Christmas. So um, that's another great place to get started doing that with your, um, your students. So there's some places that you can get started. Now, I'm, I'm going to go to some questions in just a minute, but if you're interested, I have written the book. It's an e-book and it's called Connected from the Start. It's about my journey and, how, and lots of ideas of things I have done over the years for connecting my class, ways to get started. Um, and you can find it from my book. And I believe someone else is going to jump in at this point and talk about, um, about how you can get a free copy of my book. That's right, Kathy. Uh, we're going to have a, a random drawing now for Kathy's book. 
So if you are interested, please click that hand raise button. And don't then put your hand down, because we have to basically freeze the list so that I can then enter a random, random number. So make sure you keep your hand raised so your number position doesn't change any. And we've got 11 right now in the list. Maybe 11 is all that are willing to be part of the random drawing. I heard another bell. Now we have a dozen. All right, I'm going to do some app sharing here and share a randomizer site. All right, our, we have one between 1 and 12. OK, so I'm going to type in 12 into the randomizer. And it's going to pull a random number from that. And whatever number we get is 9. So whoever is 9, um, you need to, to email Cassie. Cassie will, or Peggy will post Cassie's email. So 9 is the winner. And that's Jackie. So you need to get in touch with Cassie about the logistics. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. OK, Jackie, if you could email me, I think Peggy's going to put it in, but if you email me at Kathy at KathyCassidy.com, then um, I will send you the instructions for how to get that ebook. Um, I, I was interested that Peggy said that it's available, that she can put it on her Kindle, because it's not actually on Amazon yet. We're, we're in the process of working on that. But um, <clears throat> obviously, you're able to put it on your Kindle as well, so that's awesome. OK, I just have one more slide, and that's in, in case you want to check out my professional blog or, or um, what I'm saying on Twitter. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here, and I know that some of you must have had questions during that time. And the nice ladies here have been collecting those questions, and they are going to ask me those questions so that I can answer them for you now. That's right. Um, I think you answered this a little after this was asked, but I'll ask it anyway. How many students do you have in your class? This particular teacher has 33. So working with oh. Skype is very interesting with 33 students. Yes, 33 is a lot of students. And yeah, of course, working with anything is more difficult the more students you have. Um, I generally have between 20 to 24 students. I have, at this moment, fingers crossed, only 19 in my class. But that's, I'm sure that will change. I, usually through the year, we get, you know, I end up with about 23, 24. Mm -hmm. We get more students moving in. So, um, so that's how many I have. But yeah, it's, things are much more difficult with more. and and I, <laughs> I have had up to 28. It was, mm -hmm. Well, last year I had 32 one year. I remember I had 32. And yeah, it just everything takes longer. And right. yeah, you're right. It is a challenge. I think you also answered this one, but I'll ask it again. How do you convince parents about opening, or actually, how open are the student blogs? Um, do you have to convince parents about opening the, them to anyone? I haven't had to because I started doing this before all of the hype about, oh, we've got to protect kids. We can't let them be out there on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I was already doing that, then there was no, you couldn't say to me all of a sudden, oh, you can't do that. I, I have never had a parent who, who absolutely refused to have their, their child online. It, it's what mm -hmm. we do. What okay. I suggest to people who haven't got that background, though, is that show them my blog or show them somebody else's blog. Show them what's happening and say, this is what I want to be able to do. And mm -hmm. this is the protection things I have in mind. And so when, if they know that you've got the safety looked after and that nothing is going to get posted unless you see it first, then they're probably going to be on board. Sure. Uh, do you always oversee 
comments before they're actually posted live? Yes, yes. The comments yeah. and all posts, all comments come to me. Nothing gets mm -hmm. posted unless I see it first. Even Twitter, mm -hmm. the rule is you show Mrs. Cassidy before you tweet. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you use the iPad and a stylus to do the drawings, or do they take a photo of a, an actual physical drawing? We do both. I have statuses in my classroom. Not everybody chooses them, even when they're drawing. Some of them like to use their finger. Mm -hmm. um, some of them like to use styluses. Um, often we just take pictures of, of drawings that we've done with crayons or markers, or we might draw something on the iPad. It just, sometimes I, I tell them what they have to use, but mostly I give them a choice. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, do you teach ways to, to show learning with technology as you go, so you're teaching the technology along with something to do with it, I guess? Exactly, exactly. So I generally, with a new class, I will start with one tool and say this is what we're going to use and we're mm -hmm. all going to use it today. So we all use it, we all learn how to use it, and then we go on to another tool and I say we're all going to use this tool today. And then once we've got a bank, then I start to give them some choice. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I think you mentioned this as well, that you started with one computer and now you're one-to-one -one iPads, is that right? My journey, the whole journey sort of started because I got five computers plunked in my classroom that, that um, had internet capabilities mm -hmm. and, and that was like in the very early, that was like 15 or so years ago, my school division got a, a big deal on these five computers. And um, you couldn't put software on them, and software was the thing then. Right, and, exactly. And, yeah, and so I, that's how I started on the whole internet. I wanted these computers to be useful because they took up so much space. And so I wanted them to be useful. And that started me making a web page and, and then with the whole blogging thing. And then mm -hmm. those computers died, and then I had a couple in my classroom. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've only had my teacher computer. Then I had one iPad, and then I had two. And then I won a contest and got to have one-to-one. -one. So mm -hmm. but we make it work, whatever we have. Terrific. Your, your students are very young. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, email accounts for them? No, I no. we use my yeah. email account. Right. Yeah, they're too young for their own emails. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions from the group? Because those are the ones that I've caught from chat. Or does someone want to take the mic to share their experience? Um, yeah, that's a they, good question. Yeah, do they blog only from their class? Um, I am happy with them to blog from home, and I generally, once they are going, I, I give them that option. They very seldom do that. Um, mm -hmm. Some kids are interested in it, but it doesn't happen a lot um, for various reasons, I guess. Everybody's pretty busy and stuff, and um, I, I'm not sure why, but they are allowed to blog from home, but they don't take their iPads home, so mm -hmm. um, perhaps access is a bit of an issue. Right. Right. Do your students use email to post your own email, your personal email, to post comments? It's not necessary on my blog for them okay. to use an email account, and um, it's not generally necessary on the ones that we would comment on, because uh, right. that just adds another stage that's difficult. Sure. Sure. And I, I do know there are educational blogging sites that make it pretty easy for for students to, to comment, and I wouldn't think they would require an extra level of access to right. do that. Yeah. What I'm, is the blogging platform that you use? Sorry. I use EduBlogs, and mm -hmm. I love EduBlogs. I um, also think KidBlog is a really good option. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people use that, and they really like it. Both of them have great apps, um, and they both, EduBlogs has a few features that KidBlogs ha doesn't have yet that I really like, but KidBlogs is working hard and catching up. Um, I did discover a very great app the other day that I should share. It's called EasyBlog Junior, and there's Easy, Easy Blogger Junior as well. If I only had one iPad in my classroom, that's how we would blog, because you can put pictures of all the kids on, they just touch their picture, 
they can add their voice, they can add a picture in their voice, and it just everything is read out loud to them, and um, it's just so great for young students if you only have one or a couple of iPads in your classroom. Um, it, it's so awesome as an app. That's a great option. Um, have you ever tried Edmodo? And what do you think about it if you have? I haven't really used I you know, I've, I looked at it, didn't think that it added something that I didn't have, and so I ha I don't really go there. I know that it's a great thing if you're protected and and mm -hmm. if you aren't allowed to post things, but I have never had to go there, so I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, have you tried um, Google in the classroom? Is that suitable for young students? You know, I'm not a good one to ask about that because no, I haven't tried it. Yeah. Um, okay. There are there are certainly Google tools that I have used on occasion with my mm -hmm. with my students. Like I've I've used um, we've used documents to collect things mm -hmm. and but but not not the entire. No, no, I don't Google because I'm using other tools. Yeah. Uh, can you say more about what you include in your student digital portfolios? For sure. We include things from all the subject areas that we study. So there would be writing samples and there would be reading samples. There would be perhaps a screencast of the students um, talking about how you, what the silent E. Or there might be a screencast of the students um, talking about rhyming words or something like that. Those would be like language arts kinds of things. Mm -hmm. For math, we just finished, we're just doing patterning. And if you look at one of my students' blogs now, you'll see that they've got lots of posts about, pat about sticker patterns and about translating patterns in different ways and about, um, you know, extending patterns. And, and they've got posts with just pictures sometimes or, or sometimes with a picture with an explanation of, of those things that they've just learned. Um, when we finish science or social studies or health units, we will post um, a video that explains what we do about that. And the most common thing, the kid thing the kids like very best, is to make a poster, to put, uh, to make it a tag board and with white markers, and then they take a video of themselves explaining the things on their poster. And that's the very most popular way to explain their learning for those subject areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do your students decide what to put in their por portfolios? Are they the ones doing the choosing? Um, sometimes, it's, mostly it's me. Mostly mm -hmm. I'll say we want something posted about this. Okay. I, let them, I try to let them choose the tool that they okay. can use to post it. And as the year goes on, I say to them, you know, you don't have to just put things from school in here. You can put other things. And so they'll start to put pictures of Lego bolts that they made or something that they made out of duct tape or something like that, you know, I give them the choice. Or sometimes I might say, oh, we just finished this art project. If you want to put this in your portfolio, put it now. And if you don't, then don't do that. And so I give them more choice as the year goes on once they know the routine and how mm -hmm. to do it. Great. Um, let's see. When they create drawings they want to add to their portfolios, do you scan them or take photos of them? No, we, because we have the iPads, we just take a photo. It's so okay. easy with an iPad to take a picture and post it. Sure. Um, what technologies have you tried that didn't quite work? And there's parentheses here, supports that educators can try new things, and it's OK if it doesn't quite work with students. <laughs> um, well, I remember the first time I used Google Docs, it was kind of a disaster, because in that at that point, um, it wasn't as strong as it is now. Mm -hmm. And and if somebody clicked on the same place as you were, they would erase your typing. Oh, and right. That doesn't go over well with six oh. year olds. Oh no, no, no. They they want their they want when they put something there they want it to stay. Yeah, that, that gets them really, really upset. Exactly, exactly. So that didn't go well. Um I'll tell you a story about one thing that happened with Twitter last spring with my, my class. I had like Twitter is on everybody's um, iPad, and everybody knows the rule. You can't post without um, the teacher seeing it first. But I had a boy who was really angry at me for uh, he wasn't allowed to do something, and I don't know, even remember what it was. But he was really mad, so he got his iPad and he started tweeting nonsense tweets with um, like just random letters, and and he put the word poop in a tweet. And I, why is it that kids can spell poop 
and before they can spell other words. I don't know, but he could spell that, and and he got he was really angry. So he made all these tweets, and I wouldn't have known about it except that a teacher from Texas tweeted me and said some interesting tweets coming out of Mrs. Cassidy's class account this morning. Remember, students, the world is watching you. Oh. Such a perfect <laughs> learning experience. Absolutely. And said, wow, we have to be careful. We had another talk about why we're, we show Mrs. Cassidy first and about being responsible and digital citizenship. And mm -hmm. just a perfect way. And, and it, no, it didn't work well. But Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. From Canada to Texas. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Those were the questions that I was able to capture, and it was nice to end on a on a on a uh, funny note to some degree. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kathy. My pleasure. For upcoming Classroom 2.0 live shows, these are what we have on October 4th: Revolutionize the Research Process with Google Drive with Michael Fricano on October 11th is the open mic on digital storytelling with Wes Fryer, who will be the facilitator for that session. And October 18th, Twitter chats, what, why, how, when, with Alice Keeler. October 25th, there is no show for the DEN Streamathon virtual conference. No November 8th is the November feature teacher, Jamie Reynolds. November 15th, edweb.net for PD, Lisa Schmucky and Educator Panel. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest endeavor. He's gathered together all of his PD resources in one place rather than the many different places he has, including host your own webinar for free. That is uh, an area where you can have your own Blackboard Collaborate room for an event as long as you make the session that you're holding there public. You can nominate a feature teacher, such as Kathy today, by filling out a form at this URL, tinyurl.com, cr 2 live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. And uh, you can nominate yourself as well for the monthly featured teacher. As you exit this session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. And you can also take the link that will be in chat. Um, or you can take the link that's always in the Live Binder, in the Resource tab for the Classroom 2.0 Monthly Live Binder. In that survey towards the bottom, you'll find the two uh, areas to fill in for the professional development certificate. One is for your name, of course, and the other is for an email if you're requesting a professional development certificate. Please make sure that email, though, is a personal one rather than a school one because sometimes schools will block the email from arriving to your inbox. So that's a good point, Peggy. Try to complete the survey soon after you log out of the show because they get sent out within a couple of hours from the conclusion of the show in a group. And now your name prints out on the certificate. That's something that's changed in recent weeks. There are video collections and audio collections of shows at um, iTunes U. So you can listen to recordings or watch recordings on uh, mobile devices. Also, you can get an aggregate RSS feed of the archives as well by, by subscribing with a feed reader for the show archives on the website. Special thanks again to Kathy Cassidy, uh, to Tony for introducing Kathy, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing 
our website and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thanks so much for coming on a Saturday. In order for that recording to process, you do need to exit the session. Again, thank you for coming.